Why we continue to commiserate with the British royal family over the death of Elizabeth II, the news of her death should also awaken our calls for reparation, starting with the return of the crown jewels. The royal jewels, which include the great star of Africa and India's Kohino diamond, must be returned to their rightful owners. These are just two examples of the gains from Britain's involvement in the slave trade and colonial domination. The royal family continues to benefit from these two blight on human history. While it was nice to hear British Prince Williams express profound sorrow over slavery, which he said forever stains our history, in his speech given in Jamaica, he did not, however, bother to acknowledge the monarchy's role in that history and the extent to which he and his family continue to benefit from the sordid events of that history. In the wake of the global African movement's um, stand against racism and colonialism, so even as we continue to commiserate with the royal family for the loss of their matriarch, it is crucial to remind ourselves that we must demand that the British monarchy should reckon with its role in the current situation of Africa and the Caribbean. So what exactly are the monarchy's historical links to slavery? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee um, so that we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you've not yet done so. Turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. Of course, share our videos with all your contacts. Um, lest we forget, the royal family's link to slavery dates back to as far as 1564, when uh, John Hawkins' mercenary journey was approved by Elizabeth I. Hawkins was the first known English person to include enslaved Africans in his cargo. Also, the Royal African Company was established by Royal Charter under Charles II. The Charter gave a monopoly to the Royal African Company to trade in slaves from ports in West Africa. According to the Slave Voyages website, between 1672 and 1731, the Royal African Company transported hundreds of thousands of slaves from Africa to English colonies in North, Central, and South America. And after Charles II granted a charter to the Royal African Company, his brother, James II, was then appointed Jamaica's first governor many of the enslaved Africans that were transported by the Royal African Company were branded with the letters D.Y., which stood for Duke of York. Yes, human beings, Africans, were branded with scalding iron with the Duke of York's initials. Now, this title, Duke of York, is currently held by Andrew, brother of Charles III, the new British monarch. Under the protection of uh, the British royal family and parliament, between the years 1690 and 1807, the number of Africans transported to the Americas by British and Anglo-American ships had escalated to about 6 million. George II continued in the footsteps of his predecessors by supporting the slave trade and plantation system. Now, to be quite fair, a few members of the royal family, like the Duke of Gloucester, 
supported abolitionists like William Wilberforce. However, the majority of the members of the British royal family supported slavery and the West Indian planters. And William, the Duke of Clarence, before becoming King William IV, was a leader of the pro-slavery lobby. Unfortunately, there is currently no estimate of just how much of the current royal family's wealth is owed to slavery. However, such a reckoning is long overdue if the royal family is sincere and if uh, Charles and Williams's recent public statements really came from the heart. Now, thankfully, there's overwhelming evidence to show that the profits of the slave trade funded the treasury as well as Britain's industries, buildings, railways, roads, um, parks, and so on. Slavery enriched Britain by filling the coffers of the treasury with money from taxes levied on sugar and rum, and Britain was the greatest slave trader in the Atlantic world during the 18th century. During the same 18th century, Jamaica, the very Jamaica where William and Kate were so politely, ever so politely, confronted by the people's desire to free themselves from any obligations to the British monarchy. And, and, and it's funny, when you look at videos of, um, <laughs> of how surprised they were by being confronted by people, when, to quote Charles Leslie, uh, Charles Leslie, Jamaica was Britain's constant mind from which Britain drew prodigious wealth prodigious riches. Yet, today, Jamaica remains poor. And these young people are surprised that the people are tired and want to free themselves of any shackles. Anyway, the, the royal family cannot be separated from the evils of slavery, slave trade, and colonization by a few well-chosen and insincere sweet words. Neither can they with any clear conscience claim that they do not continue to enjoy immense benefits from that odious part of their history. The monarchy clearly still owned and used goods that were stolen during colonization, like the diamonds from India, which are still part of the crown jewel, which Pakistan and India have been demanding to be returned. There is also the Kulinan diamond, the largest uncut diamond in the world, which was mined in South Africa in 1905. The jewel was then presented to Edward VII. Later, the same diamond was then cut into several smaller pieces. The largest of the pieces was called the Great Star of Africa. This diamond is a part of the Queen's scepter, which will be passed on to Charles during his coronation. This diamond was stolen from Africa and should be returned. The monarchy should be more transparent about what the crown owns as against the family's personal effects. The dividends which continue to accrue from slave trade and colonization surround them. They can't deny seeing them. And they even live in them. Royal palaces, including Kensington Palace and Hampton Court Palace, have clear connections to King William III, who was a part owner of the Royal African Company. And according to Lucy Walsley, and I quote, all properties used by the Stuart dynasty in the 17th century were going to have an element of money derived from slavery within them. So, what should be the way forward for the royal family if they sincerely regret their ancestors' rule in slavery, slave trade, and colonization? According to uh, Professor Corinne Fowler, of the University of Leicester, who specializes in 
Britain's colonial legacies. The royal family has an opportunity to show leadership by acknowledging its involvement, making a formal apology, and openly and humbly asking what the family can do to begin to repair the damage. I also think that a solid first step towards moving on would be for Charles III to acknowledge and support claims for reparation. While to some people, even some people of African descent, the idea of asking for reparation might sound too far-fetched. There is pre precedence, although a warped kind, in the British system because Britain acknowledged its liabilities as a slaveholding nation when it started in 1834 to pay what at the time was an enormous sum of 20 million pounds as compensation for slavery to slaveholders. Now, the question which begs an answer and which we all must now demand is, if slaveholders deserve to get compensation for the loss of their trade in the Caribbean, how is the same British government still so reluctant to pay reparation to the people who were enslaved and their descendants who continue to suffer as a result of enslavement? Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you these episodes. Um, subscribe if you've not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons. Keep those questions coming and don't forget to share your videos with all your contacts. Thank you.